Roshanara. Thank you, Alison. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Just take my mask off. Um, I, I've got uh, some questions on, actually, on social mobility, a couple of questions, and also on income inequality. So could you, could you take me through uh, whether there's any evidence to suggest that social mobility is stalled in recent years in the UK? Um, perhaps, Christopher, you can start. Yeah, this is a very widely misunderstood um, area, and I take my cue really from John Goldthorpe at Oxford University, who's really the, the expert on this. Uh, he's become increasingly exasperated as the year has gone on. He does more and more research. Uh, people saying that there's huge, you know, social mobility is, is going backwards, or what have you. And, he's, and he says it hasn't, but people don't really understand what social mobility is. And um, there's, well, firstly, it should be explained that anything people say about social mobility is at least 25 years old. The nature of the research means that you are always dealing with people who were born quite a long time ago. So for a long time we were, we were looking at the comparisons between people born in 1958 and people born in 1970. People who are now in their 50s. Right? The most recent data set looks at people who were born in the early 80s, the youngest of which was born in 1984. So we have to wait, obviously, until people are at least into their 30s until we can get any idea of whether they're moving upwards or downwards. So we have no idea whatsoever about the social mobility of people who are 18 or in their 20s. Has it, so so what's the answer? It hasn't stalled or it has, and we have no idea. Based on the most recent, based, based on the, the youngest people we've looked at who are in their late 30s, um, there is still the same amount of fluidity as it has ever been, which is to say about 75% of people will move up or down um, by the time they're about 35. But what's, what has changed... percent will move up the social... Up or down. Order. Up or down. Yeah. This is flu fluidity. You see, politicians always want to hear about people going up, but uh, when you've got what is often a zero-sum game, for somebody to go up, it has to go down. What happened in the 20th, 20th century, for a large part of it, was it stopped being a zero-sum game because w the, the working class was shrinking and the middle class was I increasing. So there's more room at the top, therefore the more people who are upwardly mobile, but there's only, tragically, so many lawyers that a society can, can, can need, and so eventually that process has to come to a halt. And although it still is extending it, somewhat, it leaves more it, room for people to go down. You see it becoming more of a zero-sum game now rather than yeah. expanding. Okay. Yeah, because that can only happen once. That expansion so, of the middle class can only happen once. Unless, unless of course, you get economic growth in other, other spheres. Um, uh, perhaps, I don't, I'm just interested. So, Torsten, what do you have to say to... I was mainly going to hope it didn't only happen once because <laughs> it's going to be a pretty grim century if we don't see any economic growth returning at some point. But anyway, but um, uh, even in that particular one. So I think on the... So um, Christopher is right. There's a disagreement in the literature between people who approach this from the economic side who um, use the cohort studies and do conclude generally we've seen a slowdown in... Uh, inter, and I should distinguish between different kinds of social mobility here. So intergenerational, i.e. do you... Uh, is your relative position higher or lower in brackets than your father generally because that's what the data allows us to look at which may not be the perfect measure uh, available, but that's what it actually is in practice that, that shows a slight slowdown as Chris says the um, people that tend to focus on more class based measures including John's work um, show less change over time they, um, uh, so that, that's, on, that's on the like that way of approaching at it I think I would within that space there's other ways of coming at the same question. So, for example, what is unambiguously true, including very recent data, work we've done, also work LSE have done, which shows the same thing, which is that your parental wealth has become more important mm -hmm. in determining your life outcomes, for example, your chance of home ownership over time. And that's what I mean when I was saying earlier about wealth becoming more important to how your society feels. That's one example. Your parents determine where you live and the kind of house you live in, more than your income does. And so, can, I, can I just, just on that? Sure. And, and given what you were talking about earlier in relation to savings during COVID, you're seeing an exacerbation of inequality, at least yeah. between the top and well, uh, the bottom men and, and the other groups. Um, ha is that going to feed through further, or is that not a significant? Um, no. So we've seen. Uh, so yeah, we have we have put, we did a lot of work on that. So you see two things going on. Uh, there's, there's two changes to household wealth happening from the pandemic, which combine to create this really unusual situation we're in where wealth has gone up despite a huge recession. Yeah? So in most recessions, wealth falls because assets fall. Two things have happened. One, the one we discussed earlier, which is large increases in savings, which are distributionally spread towards higher income households. Much bigger than that effect, much bigger, 
is the effect on household wealth of the of lower interest rates and higher asset prices that follow. The obvious one of those in the UK is housing. In other countries, it's also the stock market. So the US, for example, our stock market was taking a pounding for other reasons. Um, so people didn't. The UK stock market hasn't seen the same rise as some other countries. But the um, uh, and that 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 effect is much larger and is also um, spread with higher wealth households seeing much higher increases in wealth during the pandemic. But to really really large amounts, those gaps aren't just about the bottom, by the way. It's the top and the middle. The bottom basically has zero, so you're adding yeah. a lot of percent to zero makes a lot, a lot of difference, whereas the middle to the top, these wealth gaps are stretching. Thank you. Um, Liz, unless you've got anything further to add on social mobility, I wanted to come on to the next question. Did you... I'd perhaps just point to two, two studies that, will, that may help address this question in the future. Uh, one is a piece of work that we are, 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 are beginning in, in ONS to look at socioeconomic mobility by different characteristics, including sex, ethnicity, country of birth, religion, and limiting health conditions, among, among others. And we're going to use our longitudinal study uh, to do that. That's a study of 1% of the census records, so you can imagine that's a very rich data right. source over time. Um, and so we're going to see how that pl plays through uh, across decades. Um, so we're hoping that results will be available from that ne next year to <coughs> help, help really sort of add richness to this. The other study that it's probably worth me flagging is uh, the COSMO study, which the UKRI has funded and is examining the short, medium and long-term impacts of the pandemic on social mobility and also on educational inequality, which I think is probably an important aspect yeah. of this to to be considering, and that's following the lives of uh, 12,000 school pupils currently in year 11. Um, so although they, they're not giving answers immediately for, in the, for, the, for, for uh, the committee, I think it's those longitudinal studies which are really going to mm. unpick this in a, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Um, and can you, each of you, talk me through what the drivers of inequality, income inequality were pre-pandemic and um, speak to where you see, you've already touched on some of this, where you see the exacerbation of inequalities, income inequality coming um, due to pandemic related issues. But do, do you don't, don't feel you need to repeat stuff you've already said, please, because I've got a short while to go. Justin? Um, so, in the, so the big picture of inequality is obviously huge rise in the 80s into the early 90s, big picture, flat picture since. Uh, a slight rise before the financial crisis and then a fall largely driven by labour market hits during the pandemic and benefit income being protected sorry, in the financial crisis and benefit income being protected in the financial crisis, so less affected by that big inflation surge mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. Since then, what you see is a slow, um, flat slash slow rise during the 2010s. Um, within that, what is, there's a number of phases. So you've got bad income growth for everybody, uh, in the post-financial crisis phase. You then get this like mini boom around the 2015 election, either side of it and there, where you had decent income growth. And then since 2016, two things have combined to shape the income distribution changes. One is a return of higher inflation and low nominal wage growth because of the post-referendum shock. So basically no income growth for the two years after that. Um, and then the second thing impacting that that gives you the shape of the distribution, which is um, benefit cuts kicking in from around 2016, those have very materially uh, hit the incomes of the bottom of the income <coughs> distribution. That is why you're seeing child poverty rise. Uh, that is why you see child poverty, particularly for large families, so three or four, three for kids up families significantly uh, increase. And it's why you saw over, not in the exact pre-pandemic year, but the two years before that, you saw incomes for the poorest families actually fall in absolute terms, which is very so, unusual. So we're about to see the £20 a week um, payment being uh, removed, which, uh, according to your works, uh, the Resolution Foundation work suggests uh, that poverty, relative poverty would increase from 21% to 23% by 2024 25 um, and a further 730,000 children would fall into poverty. So, uh, what's your what's your take on that? What should I mean? If if the government was, <laughs> uh, we live in hope. If the government was ever interested in reducing income inequality and reducing the impact of that, um, what should it be doing? Well, not not doing that is the right, the blindly obvious answer. Yeah, I mean it's a huge cut to the incomes 
of the poorest families in the country. It's a 5% cut on average, but for a million households, they're losing 10% of their income overnight in October. Um, that is not what you should be doing. It's not good for the macroeconomics, for the reasons we've been discussing earlier, high inflation phase, uncertainty about the trajectory for the recovery, even though there's you know, been good news in general over the last six months. So I don't think on the macroeconomics it makes sense. And in the same way that the, the introduction of the extra benefit spending during the pandemic by the government was very welcome, poverty almost certainly fell in the crisis. In absolute poverty and relative poverty almost certainly fell, although we'll have to wait for some data from DWP and ONS to confirm that. But it's basically it, almost arithmetically impossible for that not to be true. Uh, and that was very welcome indeed and helped a lot of people through some really tough times. And we're about to reverse a central plank of that at a time when inflation is... Uh, at a high level, and that is not a that is not what we should be doing. It will, in terms of, there's probably for the bottom of the income distribution, nothing else that will happen this Parliament that can have as big effect on the income of the bottom as this change. So if it, we've done some now casting forecasting for like income growth using the ONS, using the OBR's projections across this Parliament, and this change probably halves the amount of income growth. That the bottom will see over the course of those years, and that is, and, and moves it from being broadly flat across the income distribution to being a regressive inequality rising parliament with child poverty in particular rising. Not really levelling up then, is it? Well, on the income distribution, it's definitely levelling down, yeah. yeah. Liz McEwen. No, thank you. I am perhaps sort of pick, picking up on how we look at the effects of tax and benefit on, on uh, income inequality. Um, so each year we publish a publication on the effects of tax and benefits which takes us through what, what, what effect uh, they have on income inequality. Uh, so if we take the last year for which we have data to sort of illustrate this, in, in, in 1920, we start at the point of original income. This is all sources of income from employment, private pensions, investments, other non-government sources, before any tax and benefits. And the Gini coefficient that we, we've been talking about at that point is 50.5. Then uh, that reduces once cash benefits are considered to 40.8 and reduces further to the 36.3 that we were talking about earlier. Uh, once taxes and benefits are in kind, such as public education and healthcare, are factored in. Um, so, what we can do is we can look over time at the gap between the original and the gross income Gini coefficients. Um, and that gap has actually reduced over time, which is likely to highlight the diminishing effectiveness of uh, cash benefits at reducing income inequality over time, um, and, uh, and, and sort of reflects, the, the, I guess, the moderation in value of cash benefits received relative to households' original incomes. Um, and so that publication next year will, will hi highlight how the, the tax and benefits, uh, the, the changes that we're seeing at the moment play through. Thank you. Christopher, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that the the story for all these measures, really, whether it's child poverty, relative poverty, Gini inequality, any other measure of inequality, for the last 20 years has been really quite dull. I mean, nothing much has happened. They've, they've moved between a very, very narrow band. Why, why is it dull? Is it because you don't... Because, know? It's, because it's a straight line, virtually, and nothing ever happens, despite the fact that we are, particularly the last what, 10 what years... What does that mean, exactly? What do you mean by... Statistically dull, happens? that's all I mean. Statistically dull. As in, it's... it's we, we think that How do you define nothing ever happens when we're talking about quite radical, like, dramatic shifts in terms of people's income? But, well, that's... Certain policy changes. Well, that, I, I don't well, really follow... I don't really understand what you're trying to say. Well, take relative... Uh, relative poverty, for example, that has been, it was is 22% currently. 18 years ago, it was 22%. It dropped briefly to 21%. It has never changed between 21% or 22%. It, you know, and this is at a time where for so what do at you least... Make of, what do you make of this 730,000? Sorry, I'm pitting <coughs> you both against each other now. The, the Resolution Foundation figure of 730,000 children falling into poverty because of just one policy to change. Yeah, well, what we, would we, you we, say to that? Is well, that nothing I'd say, ever happens? I'd say that, yeah, you know, uh, boy who cried wolf. Or do you, do you di disagree with it? I, I think it's unlikely, because I'm so used to think tanks uh, claiming that we're going to see spiralling inequality or spiralling child poverty or X number of people falling into poverty on the basis of usually quite minor changes to whether it's a benefit system or austerity, whatever. We've had it for 10 years mm -hmm. Um, of, of these constant predictions of doom, the Human Rights Commission predicted 
child poverty rate of 43% by next year, a few years ago. I have a bet with Jonathan Porter that this will not happen. He wrote, he wrote, the, he wrote the report. It clearly isn't going to happen. It's, what is it at the moment? You know, I represent a constituency who is very, with very high levels mm -hmm. of poverty in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, do, are you telling me that I'm imagining it? No, because, but I'm, what I'm saying is the, these... <laughs> so, I don't really... What I'm saying because, is the... Por because the por you disagree with it, it doesn't exist? Is I'm saying the proportion saying? hasn't changed over time, despite the fact that people are constantly saying, oh, well, you know, next time it's going to it's going it, to shoot it has, up. Actually. It, has, it, is, it has been... The child poverty, relative child poverty after housing costs, has been around about 29%. For about 20 years. Uh, last year, 2019 20, it did tick up from 29 to 31%, that being about the same as it was in 2007. Um, it has not come anywhere close to 43%, which, is, which would be breaking all records by a considerable margin, which is what people claim. It hasn't risen significantly in 60, any other year. It's 60% year. in my constituency, and it wasn't 60% mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, Torsten, do you want to... Do you were trying to come in. No, no, I mean, look, income inequality hasn't moved up and down hugely. Poverty on a society-wide level... Uh, peaks in the 90s, does then fall by... I mean, and also, remember, smallish percentage movements here are lots of human beings. Yes. Okay, so let's be a bit careful. So poverty is like 24, 25% in the 90s, falls down to about 22, 21% in the 2000s. Within that low, real things are going on. Okay, so pension poverty is falling. Mm -hmm. Child poverty is not. So if you look at child poverty, I, I definitely don't agree uh, that big changes haven't happened. And that's, by the way, despite the fact that our official data... Uh, hides how big those changes are for reasons that we probably don't want to go into but hopefully the ONS and DUP are going to fix in the coming years but the uh, but child poverty falls really significantly in the early 2000s um, it then rises a re just before the financial crisis does fall during the financial crisis again because of the benefit protection I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. it then has risen by about 700,000 children since the bottom at uh, bottom of the child poverty like short term uh, trough in 2011 uh, by 700,000, and as I say, another 700,000 could go into child poverty, but taking us back to those 90s levels, if we see. Now, that's a long way short of the 43% odd that Christopher is talking about, and I, uh, I haven't seen the paper he's referring to, but our anxiety is one, it, big increases have happened, and they've happened in the recent past, the last five years. Could they happen again? Uh, if we go ahead with the £20, then compared to what poverty levels were during the pandemic, when, as I say, poverty fell because of what the government did, then I think it is almost impossible for poverty not to rise in the coming years. You, you say 90s level. Yeah, 90, 90s is the peak for child level, poverty. Yeah. Which is staggering, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's set, uh, setting us back, um, progress back, uh, achieved by successive governments in different ways. Yep. Okay, thank you.